entire Think Trees New Mexico board for the many, and I say many, behind the scenes hours to pull this off. That said, please be patient with us if we experience technical difficulties. I'll address more about the board tomorrow morning and uh, the need we have for more members. We need to give a special shout out to our sponsors. Frankly, without their financial support, we would not have been or had the confidence to pull this off. Please take some time during or after the presentation or during the uh, break uh, to visit the sponsor's sites in Whova. Click on their logo to view their site and to make contact. Oh, just got a news flash. There will be a chainsaw door prize. Yes, Steel has donated a brand new Steel MSA 140 battery chainsaw. If you are a paid attendee, you have already qualified. No additional steps necessary. Your name has gone into a designated chainsaw hat. Thank you, George. The attendee's name will be randomly drawn and the winner will be announced at the conclusion of Friday's presentation. Thank you again, Steele. On to CEUs, please take note. The following entities are granting CEUs for those in attendance. NMDA Pesticide License, New Mexico Association of Landscape Architects, ISA and, and Rocky Mountain Chapter, Society of American Foresters. For the ISA and New Mexico Landscape Architect CEU codes will be provided at the completion of each session. Enter that number or write it down um, on a piece of paper or on the form for each session. For the rest of you, we have our ways to determine if you attended or not. Here are the four steps needed to follow and get CEU approval. All of this is in uh, Whova under CEU forms. Visit the CEU form tab in Whova, download the link, CEU form or forms that you need. Three, add your name and membership or license number to the form. Remember for ISA and landscape architects, a session code again will be provided at the end of each session and write it down. This will not be given again or repeated. Uh, then once you complete your form, email the completed form to thinktreesnewmexico at gmail.com. We will process these over the coming week. We don't need to get your form right at the end of the conference, but we'd like to get it no later than next week. Okay to attend each presentation. Please remember at the completion of each session, follow, following the Q&A, you will need to click the agenda link for the following session. Here's an example. At the completion of Dr. Gilman's presentation, there will be a 15 minute silent break. During this break, you will go to the agenda in Whova and select Dr. Kane's presentation, which is the second presentation today. Basically, this is because each presentation is being live streamed separately. So we need to enter in the new stream. Let's talk briefly about Q&A versus chat. Once you've selected the presentation, you'll notice a Q&A tab and a chat tab. The chat tab, is to visit with fellow attendees like you would do in the hallway or sitting next to you at the conference. The Q&A button is specifically for the speaker. These questions will be reviewed by the moderators and shared with the presenter at the end of the session. If you see a question you are also interested in, you can upvote that question so it is more likely to be asked first. Our hope is to get to all the questions. If we do not have time, each of the speakers are willing to 
answer your questions via email following the conference. Each speaker's email address is at the end of their bio in Whova. If you are have, having any technical questions about using Whova or about the conference, please post them in the community room uh, in Whova under Ask Organizers Anything. We have operators standing by to answer your questions. Okay, you ask, who are today's moderators? Thank you for asking. Monday was President's Day, and for Think Trees, so is today. Today's moderator, Ann Beard, is the Systems Forestry Manager for PNM, and we are proud to say the current president of the International Society of Arboriculture. Hear applause in the background. Ryan Sir has served as president of Think Trees since the day he was born and performed admirably. As Brian steps down, we thank him for his dedication to all the trees of New Mexico. So please, Anne and Brian, take it away. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. My name is Ann Beard, as Andrew had said, and I'm very pleased to be here as your moderator for today's sessions. Um, I will be introducing the uh, wonderful speakers that we have lined up for you today, um, and Brian Sewer will be monitoring that Q&A um, box on Whova app, so all your questions for, for Dr. Gilman, and our later speakers um, will be um, monitored very closely by Brian, and hopefully we we'll be able, we'll be able to get to all of your questions once uh, Dr. Gilman's uh, talk is finished. So without further ado, I would like to um, introduce a longtime friend of Think Trees, Dr. Ed Gilman, who was on the University of Florida faculty as professor since 1984. He has received honorary membership in the uh, American Society of Landscape Ar Architects in 2016. Dr. Gilman has written an illustrated guide to pruning and it's in his third edition. He received the ISA's Author Citation Award in 1999, the Excellence in Education Award in 2003, Arbicultural Research Award in 2007, and the Award of Merit, ISA's highest award in 2016. He has published more than 120 scientific peer-reviewed journal articles on roots, planting, pruning trees in 35 years in academia and in, his, in the industry. Dr. Gilman has conducted more than 800 presentations to professional groups throughout his career, including Think Trees New Mexico. And um, we are very, very pleased to have him once again here to present for us today. And a very warm welcome, round of applause for uh, Dr. Gilman. Take it away. Good morning and uh, welcome to Planting Trees. Simple, right? Simple deal. How tough can this be possibly? Let me do a little house cleaning here. Show, okay. All right, very good. Uh, they call me Professor Emeritus. All that means is I still work a little bit for nothing, <laughs> which is close to close to the last 40 years anyway. But no, welcome to uh, to planning sample, right? First of all, uh, and can you guys all hear me? Okay, start there. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, cool, very good. So um, I'm going to say some things that might make you uncomfortable because you either had heard contrary or believe for some reason contrary. And, and that's not to say you're wrong because we all have our own experiences. So what I'm gonna really do today is share the experiences we've had with about 150 studies of root systems and pruning over the years since the, let's see, when did I start this? Uh, I guess you'd say the late seventies in graduate school. 76 to 81 in uh, New Jersey, and then moved on, worked with Bartlett a little bit in Charlotte, and then Chemlon, and then North Carolina, and then landed in Florida about uh, 40, 
almost 40 years ago. So um, I've killed a lot of trees in my life, probably 3,000 or so, with the intention of learning something about the root systems. And just in the last five years, uh, right before I retired, it's probably 1,300 root systems just in that five-year period, trying to figure out what is a good root system, what makes a stable root system, what leads to high vitality after planting. So we'll share some of that uh, work with you. We only have an hour or so. About half the time is going to be roots. The other half is going to be tops. So here's how we learn about roots. You know, this 100 inch tree spade, we planted probably eight years prior to this photograph. We planted these trees from 30 gallon containers and imposed a number of treatments. This happened to be a planting depth study. And then here, seven, eight years later, uh, we were good enough to have a 100 inch tree spade, dug them up, washed to measure lots of stuff. All, everything that I'm going to talk about today has been published in Arbor Culture and Urban Forestry. That's our, that's the ISA's scientific journal. And it's all linked from my website, University of Florida website. If you Google my name, Ed Gilman, you'll go right to that Landscape Plants website. So I'm going to share with you as, uh, as, as much as I can um, some resources that are on that website first. And this is, a this is a project where we developed about 70, 70, 70 planting details and some pruning details as well. But it focuses on planting and irrigation. And there are also four specifications. That's the long 25 to 30 page Word document that supports all the, the details. So those two go hand in hand. The landscape architects in the group know the difference. Uh, most in arboriculture, uh, including myself, until about 12 or 15 years ago, didn't really know the difference. But you know, we all learn at different paces. And uh, so these are the details. The specs are also on our website that I just mentioned. And this one's different. This you'll see actually has roots in the detail. I think it's the only details available out there that have actual real looking root systems. You'll notice some of the roots are at the surface, which is going to be a theme for today. And as we go through this, uh, it's too small for most people to read. And there's a lot of detail here. That's why they're called details. This would be planting in a high, like a compacted soil or high water table. You'll notice some portion of the root system is of uh, the root ball, I should say, is above the soil. What, one thing that's cool about this is for those that work with CAD in the audience, um, and if, if, if you're not sure what CAD does or, or, or you don't work with it, talk with your engineer, architect, or landscape architect friends. They all work with it. So this file, and the other 75 planting details can be imported into CAD from the website as DWG files. Those get imported directly into CAD, and then you can modify these. Uh, we take no responsibility for the modifications. You're pretty much on your own, and we, we uh, warn you that. The attribution is in the lower right. You can see Urban Tree Foundation uh, secured the funding for Jim Urban, myself, and, and two others to work on this uh, over a couple of year period. They're open source, they're free to use. You don't have to cite where you got them from. Uh, but if you're putting them in a publication, you know, it might be courteous to cite uh, where they came from. So we've got lots of details. Here's a slope. I just showed you well-drained soil, poorly drained soil. Here's a slope. And here's if you're gonna modify the soil. And you can see on the extreme left, lower third, it says modified soil. And then it says sea soil prep plan. And so if you go into the specifications on the website, you'll see all the details there about how to modify uh, soil. I think that spec specification is about 30 pages long. It's What's nice about that specification that's, that's free for you all to use is that it's modifiable and there's there are instructions to the specifier that that'd be you to answer or amend edit certain items in there and we have lots of instructions in red font so it'd be different than the black font which you would of course publish as part of your 
a request for bids to plant trees on, on a job. So here's four take home lessons. I hope it's not too many. We'll go through, we won't go through the last two because we simply don't have time. We'll focus mostly on the first two, but permanent planting to improve branch architecture. Remove roots growing over the collar and those at the edge of the root ball when you're planting containers. Irrigate the root ball during establishment. It's not so much important during establishment period to irrigate outside there, except for the places and times of years where it gets extremely dry. You might gain some benefit there, but in the first few months, it's the root ball that needs the water. And this is all backed up by research that we and others have done. The last, and again, this is the only time we're really gonna mention this, is mulch on the root ball can cause more harm than good. Research are very close to you guys physically. Uh, Chris Martin showed that, so did Mike Arnold moving east in Texas, and we showed this in Florida. So there's, there's good backup for that. Mulch outside the root ball to your heart's content. Uh, but just very small layer, an inch or less or none on, on the root ball. So here's a quick outline of what we're going to do today. We will not get to the last part, the establishment part much, but we'll certainly get you going. We're going to start out with nursery stock and then pruning it, planting, root growth in nature and root growth in the nursery. So let's start with planting stock. First, if we go back and look at some basics, and this has been known for a long time, but in arboriculture, maybe 15 or 20 years or so, 15 years is probably more accurate. And what we and others have found is when the branches are small compared to the trunk, we call that a small aspect ratio, just a ratio of diameter of branch to diameter of trunk, the union is strong. But when the two items, as in a codominant stem, are the same size, then it's easier to separate the two. And so when we grow nursery stock, we remember this. When we're purchasing nursery stock, we remember this. And I'll show you a detail that will, uh, will get you there where you can specify it. So the, the Apple industry figured this out, figured this out, aspect ratio, and the more likelihood to fail at a larger a larger aspect ratio. About 70 years ago, when basically the Malus, the apple orchard business in, in North America transitioned from the open center or vase shape to the central leader, it's about 70 years ago. So back literally in the late 60s and into the 70s is when this really got started. And that went for about 60 or so years. Now there's a different system. I won't go into that, but we grow apples mostly on trellises in the, in the, uh, the newer farms. Also on the left, pistachio here. These are all photos that I've taken out in the farms there in walnut, uh, in this English walnut, the edible walnut on the right. And the more innovative and uh, smarter farmers are transitioning from the open bays uh, to the central leader or dominant leader uh, form. So back in, so so maybe we have something to learn from from uh, these these guys. And I, I, I like to spend time in, in various tree industries to get to learn what other people are doing. So here is my, a representation on the left that I drew about 20 years ago, and it's pretty good quality. There are more uprights than uh, we care for. Uh, more on that in a second. And then the very center is a photograph in, from Nebraska someplace I took of uh, some pretty nice uh, planting stock, high quality, I'd say. Here's another in the same parking lot. If we take a, a close look at that part of the tree, we can actually see three or four main leaders at the top. The grower did a great job from the, the arrow, the horizontal arrow down. But then in the last four, five, six months, the grower did no pruning. Maybe that was over the winter or, or early spring and some codominance developed at the top. That's very typical. I don't think we can expect our growers to take care of all of that. So we have to take care of it at planting. 
Boy, we could spend two hours literally on pruning and planting. We're, we're, we're going to spend just uh, 10 minutes or so. Here's another example of a high quality, probably the highest quality. This is Corcus virginiana, which I'm guessing in the southern part of the state is, is planted at least occasionally. And it, you see a reduction cut there made by the grower finishing up that tree. Great, great plant. These are some trees, Corcus. Uh, these are lobotus going in a very large campus, 7,000 trees going and looking more or less like this. And uh, Brian Kempf was good enough to loan me this photo showing just the high quality being produced in some of our nurseries uh, today and in, in a few places in the US. So this would be our goal. And we're, I'll show you a little bit of detail in a second of how you get there, at least on paper. And then we're not gonna do production pruning in a nursery today. We just don't have time. Not acceptable would be codominance uh, in the lower to mid canopy, and there's various ways to spec that, and I'll show you that in just a second. Another example of not acceptable. And to prevent this from showing up, uh, and this is a real nursery. This is not made up. These are photos right off this nursery's website uh, showing, showing their crops. As you might put something in a specification like terminal buds shall be intact over the entire crown. Just that statement would prevent this from happening because there's no terminal buds intact over any part of the crown in, in this one. So you can be creative on this. These are just ideas. There's many ways to, to approach this. So in order to get on paper the concepts of what I just covered, this is a crown observations or call it crown inspection. The, the landscape architect and, and that construction and design field calls it crown observations. The word observations is, is important, but it's, it's essentially an inspection. So across the top, you see acceptable. And, and if you could read that detail on your computer at your leisure, you'd see that we're specifying the branches should be smaller than a certain size of the trunk. So the aspect ratio should be small smaller than 0.66 is where we start with in, in, this, in this detail. So again, if you want that, that to be smaller, and I would ask you to consider making it smaller, you would download this and port it into a CAD program using the DWG file, make your edits, and then republish as part of your uh, request for proposals. And then on the bottom are larger aspect ratios. So anything larger, trees with branches with ratios larger than two thirds. And again, you can modify that number if you like, would be unacceptable or, and rejectable on the site. So folks, this is the most important thing about sustainable urban forestry in my view, other than getting the tree, you know, taking care of the root systems from, from the ground down. But from the ground up, I don't think there's a more important start to the a successful sustainable urban forest than the objective of developing good structure in the tree because that controls whether the tree is going to be there or not after the storm all right so that's a brief introduction to nursery stock and that'll give you enough to be perhaps extremely dangerous but there's a lot of information on our website there are about 50 no, there's a, about 100 videos now on the, the front page of, of the Landscape Plants website that I shared with you earlier. And you can read and listen to your heart's content there. I just summarized it. Ah, wish I could see your eyes and faces to, uh, to see where the questions are and we take care of them. But we, we are gonna move on because of the format. So let's talk about pruning at planting then. So there's four reasons as I see it. And I've thought a lot about this in the dozens of countries I've been in and every state except Arkansas for some reason I've spoken in. Uh, and so I learn a lot. And these are the four things that happen that um, when, when trees are not pruned at planting to develop good architecture. We're not pruning to somehow balance the root system whatever that means. That is a very old information. Please ignore that. Pruning a planting to develop good architecture, however, I'm going to show you right here, right now, is a very good idea. 
So ask yourself, is that tree likely to receive structural pruning routinely in the next 15 years? Now, seriously, we, most of us know the answer to that question. There are examples of places, and I can share that with you. I'm not going to, but I could tell you where, where this is taking place. But in many cases, it's not. So you've got a professional there at planting. Why not put pruning for structure at planting in your specs? and then teach people teach people how to do it. Basically, why this happens is because in most places in the US, perhaps Florida is an exception uh, because we put a grower on our ISA board and Andrew is, is very much involved in Think Trees, which is fantastic and being a grower, this is, this is great. So congratulations. But most growers do not go through arboriculture training. Most arborists don't go through grower training. So there's not a good understanding of what the other, the other folks do. So if we can get the grower to keep the middle and lower branches with a small aspect ratio, you and I can take care of the trees at planting. So I, I want to show this, this example to you. Here's an Acer rubrum. I chose this because it's almost used Acer, that genus, through, through much of the country, maybe not so much in New Mexico, but it's going to suffice to work. So let me shrink this photo down and show you how it's going to grow after I pick out the leader in white and then the five or six competing fairly large diameter branches in red. So a, think of tree structure as a plumbing system. So water's coming up with nutrients coming up the trunk, and it's going to be distributed among those branches according to what? According to aspect ratio. So the branches with the biggest aspect ratio, in other words, the largest branches compared to the trunk, they're going to get the most goodies. So which ones are going to grow after planting? It's the ones with the biggest aspect ratio, right? So let's take this very simple example. I'm pointing out the competition. That's the, the single red arrow there. And watch what happens to it and the leader in the next few years after planting is both sides grow, the, the red branch and the main leader. And so I'm gonna blow this up, same tree. You can see now we have a, a, a well-defined co-dominant stem. And in many of the species we, we all work with, we recognize this as a potential defect and, and a point of, of potential failure. I'm going to show you some red maples through time. So there I've circled by the do not enter sign. You can see the circle with the double leader codominant stem. Here's a, about a 40 or 50 year old Acer rubrum, same species just to kind of track this through time. It's obviously a different plant, but same species. This is in a golf course in North Carolina. Take a close up of this and you can see two failed branches. So you can see this pretty well in either photo, the close up or the larger uh, view on the right, is both of those branches that failed were likely to be on the tree when the tree was planted. And in fact, I can guarantee you. So this was probably the bottom of the crown at planting. The top of the crown was probably up in this neighborhood. There was a little double leader at the top and the branch at planting right here was probably the size of a pencil. And so was the codon that broke out. So just that very innocent looking, you know, things the size of your fingers at planting can lead to this without structural pruning. And let's face it, most, most trees just don't, at least in 2021, don't receive uh, much of this at any time. So we're trying to prevent branches that are on the tree at planting, like, like this codom here. You see there's a close up on the left. It's got a bark inclusion, obviously, very weakly connected. But just the fact that they were the same size is, is, is in, indicative of a weak connection as well. This one also had a, an inclusion, which made it even weaker. So we're trying to prevent these uh, things from happening. These two limbs, were, or this broken limb, I should say, excuse me, was on the tree when the tree was planted, about six or seven feet up off the ground is where this limb that failed. That's where it was at planting. Of course, it's still in the same spot, right? And it just got bigger because it was the same size as the trunk. 
So to illustrate this, uh, my mother was good enough to, to provide me with uh, an interest in illustration and painting and art and so forth when I was a, a youngster. So I've, uh, I've gotten better at this through time. But you can see a double leader in planting. And then at the arrow point, here I am, what are we, 30 years after planting, 20 years after planting, depending on the site and the species, uh, both sides grow. And if you look at, yeah, okay, I thought I had another slide in there. But if you look at a close-up of that, you'll see that the, both of those codominant stems, both at planting and 30 years later, are the same size because the, tr the tree structure is like a plumbing system. What's going to grow is what's big today. It's also going to be big tomorrow. All right, so we're, uh, we're making good progress here, right at, at 930. Very good. Good job. So pr pruned planting, why? To prevent breakage. And we just gave you a lot of examples of that. The second reason to prune at planting is to prevent large pruning wounds. And so I've got one example of that here. Here's a tree on the left. This is Chinese elm, Ulmus parvifolia on the left. And this is probably, uh, it's probably three inches of caliper when I planted it. So this probably three years ago, maybe four years ago on the left, I took that photograph. Uh, four years after planting. So you can see that the, the leader, that's the white arrow, wants to grow up, but because we did not suppress the growth, so you see the red arrows are, are going toward the trunk, so that's supposed to indicate because we did not suppress the trunk, everything grew, and here we are 14, year later, 14 years later on the right, and you can see, of course, that one branch on the left is still in the same position. They, we all know they don't move up the tree. Many of our customers don't know that. I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, and now it's growing horizontally to the left. And so it's too low on the tree for lawn maintenance, pray tell. And so what the campus decided to do was to remove the branch and uh, making about an eight and a half, nine inch pruning cut. Not the greatest management, is it? A lot of us recognize that. So cutting through uh, dysfunctional wood, heartwood most likely in this case, that's the brown in the center. Never a great idea. I hate cutting through heartwood. I always like to, to work in the sapwood making, making cuts. But this is not uncommon. If So the, let's go back here. So look on the right and we as arborists almost have two choices. Well, I think we do have two choices. When we're presented with a tree like this, be them in parking lot islands, along a street, what have you, and the customer, whoever they are, the mall manager, the homeowner, the municipality, wants clearance. That's, that is a very legitimate and understandable objective. And so we have two two uh, avenues we can go, two options. We can either do this, a lot of people are reluctant to do this, or we can lion's tail the tree. And so our industry right now tends not to do this, although you do occasionally see it, we tend to lion's tail instead, leaving that branch on the tree. So we end up with these 30 to 60 foot long codominant stems arising from the lower six to 12 feet of the trunk because no one is willing to take the branches off uh, earlier. And it gets very difficult to convince anyone to make this kind of a cut. So that's where we are uh, today. And that's why it's a good idea to prune at planting to prevent having to make that decision. I am absolutely convinced that because most people, even citizens that know nothing about trees, are reluctant to make those big cuts on the lower part of the tree. So, and you don't like the lion's tail for lots of reasons that we're not going to go in today. But that's why lion's tailing is done, because we do not prune at planting in the early years. You should have re reduced the, the length of that branch earlier. And I'll show you that in a little bit. 
The third reason for pruning and planting is to prevent the leader from choking out. So this is on the Virginia Tech campus uh, in Blacksburg, Virginia, probably six years ago. And you see the top center is starting to decline. This is in July, July as I remember. So it should not look like this way too early for fall color, but the middle and bottom of the crown looks fantastic. So we take a close up and I, you know, I suspected perhaps a root problem, but the roots, look at the roots, they look fantastic. Nice straight roots, almost no crossing over, no circling roots. If we could have trees like this through our urban forest, how happy would we be? We'd be very happy. But when we look at the rest of the tree, you can almost see the original tree when it was planted. I can. I think you could probably look out the window from where some of you are sitting right now and find trees that look like this without even getting up out of your seat. And so what you're looking at is all the branches that were on the tree when it was planted were left on the tree. There wasn't any pruning done. And so these low branches got very big because they were big when the tree was planted. The tree probably looked fantastic when the tree was planted, but the branches were just big, like 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, the size of the trunk that they were growing from. And then eventually these big branches physically choke out the leader. So the wood is unable to grow around these large branches because there's so many clustered together at one point. And man, I could show you these till the cows came home tonight photographs I have and then uh, tell you many stories about this for many different species of trees. So there I gave you three I think clear reasons why pruning and planting is a great idea. Now I will not have time to show you the research that we and the only other study I've seen done in Copenhagen have clearly shown that pruning and planting has no downsides uh, whatsoever. And I'll be glad to deal with that in the Q&A uh, sessions. So let me give you some examples of pruning at and soon after planting. So it takes just a few seconds for me to determine which branches are going to be pruned. It's the ones that are larger than about half the trunk diameter. You know, use your own number. That's the number I use. So pick one out. Can you find one that's bigger? This is a Corcus slobata in Central Valley, California. So I'm not too far away from you guys. Can you pick one? There's one, bigger than half the trunk diameter. How about a second one? There's a second one. Third one, fourth one, right? So those are half the trunk diameter or bigger. So I can tell that driving by at five, 10 miles an hour easily. I can say, oh, there's about four or five branches that need to be pruned. Now, maybe removed, but pruned in some way. We haven't determined what we're going to do yet. I'll show you that in a second on this particular tree. So then what would you do? The, I pointed out four. What would you do? Sitting there, what you know today, what would you do for, those, for that tree on these four branches, those four there? Give you about 10 seconds to look at that tree. You're going to remove them. You're going to reduce them. You're going to do a combination. What are you going to do? All right, so I'm going to show you a photograph of the after situation. It'll come up on the right. So what we ended up doing is removing three on the right and then reducing one on the left. Yeah, I'm not, I didn't put in the slide to show you where the cuts were, but we removed three on the right, reduced one on the left. There's the tree one year after planting. There's the tree three years after planting. So before we pruned on the left and then three years after we pruned on the right. So we were pretty aggressive on the tree on the left three years ago, but because we're aggressive early, it's like training children to become good citizens. Yeah, get rid of the stuff early and train them right and then it's so much easier to manage that tree now. So then with the obvious objective of raising the crown over time on the right, because we're in a highway median, those branches remain small in diameter because we removed the big ones and reduced some of the other big ones. Because we did that work early, the cuts were small 
They were through sapwood only, so we're not cutting through dead heartwood. So there's less likelihood of decay. The sapwood can really fight this decay uh, pretty well. And now it's a no-brainer for the tree, taking off some of those low branches with time to get your canopy up 15, 20 feet before the branches uh, uh, come out uh, and go over the street or roadway. So a little bit of the into the weeds here, how you would uh, do this. And, and, you know, this today is really more about philosophy of approach than the details, but I'm going to show you some details here. So pick out the leader or the stem that will make the best leader. Identify the competitors. In this case, there's two. And then either choose a moderate approach in the center using reduction cuts or on the right, a more aggressive approach that would entail some removal cuts. And then rolled into all this, there's a lot here, right? Rolled into this is when are you coming down? When are you coming back, I should say, to prune the trees again? And then what is the customer's tolerance for voids? So you roll those in together in your brain and you decide either with the client or yourself uh, what is the appropriate approach. So you might take the middle approach if you're coming back every year or two. You might take the right approach there on, on the right, a more aggressive approach if you're uh, either never coming back or five or 10 years or longer. <clears throat> so what we just what we're going to do is in this simple illustration, we're going to reduce the left codominant stem and then 20 years later, 30 years later, that stem, which I'm pointing to is right here, instead of being a codominant stem with the trunk, it's now tremendously reduced in size compared to all the growth that took place in the trunk because we didn't prune the trunk very much. Just a couple little cuts up here. So this is a much more aggressive approach uh, over there. So it slowed that side of the tree down more. The more you prune, the more you reduce growth in the future. So you get a, a reduction in the aspect ratio, an improvement in strength, in other words, preventing the breakage. And there's also better biology inside the base of that small stem now on the right. Small aspect ratios have the branch protection zone. So when you cut that off in the future for your raising the crown, it's a no-brainer for the tree. You got most of your carbon up in the tree instead of making a giant pruning wound or having the lion's tail the tree. So hopefully this is rolling into a story into your brain. It's fun, isn't it? I love pruning trees. So let's look at, let's um, look at some examples. So here's a, a calorie pair that uh, we've come to, to we've, we love to hate now, right? But you, you can actually put good structure in just about any plant, including, including a weeping willow, if you start early enough. So here we are before and after pruning, we've got a nice leader. Using reduction cuts, removal cuts, and notice there's a heading cut over here. Trees of this size, when you're cutting one or two year old wood, I'm fine with heading cuts. It's in our ANSI A300 pruning standards. We can use heading cuts. Here's a, <clears throat> there's a lot more to that story, right? But it's, it's in our standard. So here on the left, we have a large aspect ratio codominant stem. There we're making one pruning, oh no, I forgot a slide, that's right. So the one pruning cut is right here, the reduction cut is there. And here we are two years later, and you can clearly see that reduction cut there. So what we did is this pruning cut here, this one reduction cut, push growth up into the leader so that two years later, you can see how much bigger the trunk is. This is simple. This is not complicated stuff. And here we are five years later. There's the original pruning cut. This is the same exact tree. And so we suppress growth in the prune side, increase growth, obviously, here on the, on the right, which is the, the main leader. So we went from that potential codom, which uh, I guarantee if that tree was to be pruned by Bubba's tree service, hope Bubba isn't in the audience, uh, with removal cuts, leaving those codominant stems, then uh, the tree is likely to be lion's tailed with a permanent codominant stem forever. And I think most people in the audience that are arborists or have that inclination a uh, little, little bit of knowledge and, and, um, and looking would, would agree with that. 
So what would you do here? I've circled the codominance or near codominance in this acer. And so we've got to be very aggressive on the biggest branches. So the, the largest aspect ratio branches, that's where we made our, our deepest cut, remove the, the, the largest amount. And then we combination of reduction and heading cuts on this youngster. And you can see on the right clearly after pruning, we've got a central leader. This is a Quercus lobata. Sometimes we'll remove entirely the codominant stem. Tree looks great on the right after pruning. All right, now if we want to be a little gentler for because we're coming back often or the customer has a low tolerance for voids, then um, reduction of the part would, would be a, a really good approach. If we're catching it a little bit later in time and notice the trees are getting slightly bigger with time here to sort of allow you to, to, to look at some catch up. And this is a nice seven year example. I'm only gonna show you a couple of slides here though, but we started seven years ago on the left and then we pruned, you can see on the right there making removal and reduction cuts. This is an Acer uh, Saccara, it's sugar maple. And uh, I haven't pruned outside in New Mexico, folks. That's why I don't have trees from your, <laughs> your place. But, you know, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, I've been all over the place, all over Europe. I'd be glad to come. We need to do this in New Mexico. And so many places we've come back over the years, uh, probably got 20 spots around the planet where we come back routinely. But in any case, here's a year later on the left, year after pruning. And then uh, this is six years after pruning. You see on the right, the tree now has a, a, a nice dominant leader uh, with, with just uh, two pruning episodes over uh, this six year period. So we can, we can really change and control the shape and structure of trees. Structure is really important. So, you know, I often ask, we in arboriculture have given up tree structure and architecture to our growers by not pruning and planting. So why have we done that? It, worldwide, <clears throat> if you look at tree structure, so many trees start on the left and are left that way. Lower branches removed, three codominant stems end up controlling 85, 90% of, of the foliage. And then we end up having the lion's tail. Th these trees were lion's tail. And then we end up with potential liabilities with codominant stems and bark inclusions. So let's start early. Here is a piece of paper, a document that you can publish with your RFP to do some planting. And it shows a simple example of before pruning, what to take off and dash lines and what the tree looks like afterwards. So this crown correction detail can be incorporated into landscape plants. All right, so that's pruning and planting. You know, we could do more, but we're gonna shift to underground now. We're going to do root growth in nature and then root growth in the nursery and then a little bit of planting. So here's what I want you to remember. Root systems in nature, straight roots, some at the surface is going to be the theme over the next 25 minutes or so. So straight roots, some at the surface. So when you are You'll see in, in the specifications that we've written on our website for root inspection or root observations that those words are in that document. So uh, that's a good reference for you. But let's start in nature. So here's a seed turning into a seedling. Then on the right, we see a, maybe a year later or so. So when a taproot comes out of the seed, often it will grow more or less straight down. And then that taproot hits an area in the soil, high pH, very dry, too wet, compaction, uh, et cetera. And that taproot would become stressed and unhappy. So the tree sends a signal to the top of the root system near the soil surface, hey, I need some help. And so there you see on the right, that process exhibiting itself. So you see lateral horizontal roots growing fairly straight, very close to the surface. So when we say we want straight roots, some at the surface, we're mimicking mother nature. And I'm gonna show you how to do that and how to check for it. 
So th this is this would be regarded as sort of our model root system. This is a root system I dug up in 1978. Some of the first root systems I dug up as a uh, little boy, I guess. <laughs> that was I was a grad student. I was an early grad student. So you can see the, the, the taproot went down, divided into two, and then the horizontal roots come uh, at the surface. And they're more or less the, uh, the right angle formed by the, the root and the trunk there is more or less common in, in many areas of the world. So that's, uh, that's some detail there. Here's a Fraxinus root system in uh, Florida that was laying by the side of the road. And I decided it was going to make a great uh, demonstration for how the taproot went down, hit a clay layer here in this particular soil, and then that stress formed the surface roots or, or, or caused the, the hormones to initiate new roots at the surface. Uh, most likely or most attributed to auxin levels uh, initiates that. And then with time, these horizontal roots grow out and then these pegs develop or sinker roots develop along the horizontals. So you see that three-dimensional, you can kind of envision that three-dimensional wood structure of horizontal roots, maybe a taproot, maybe not, depending on the soil. And then these sinker roots hold together a whole lot of soil. And that's what holds trees up. Soil holds the tree up. The roots really don't. The roots hold the soil together and the soil holds the whole thing from rotating. So then you get this uh, classic trunk flare with the roots transitioning into the, into the trunk. So if we look at a partially excavated root system, I think it's kind of typical. It's a clay soil, this happens to be in Singapore, but it could be anywhere. It's a clay soil, you know, moderately drained, standing water after lots of rain for a while, but typical, I think, of a lot of soils. And so if we lift this root system up, we can see that most of the action is at the surface. Now, I'm going to impose a container root system from a nursery on this photograph. So what you're looking at is most of the roots came out from the top of that container, didn't they? The roots that kind of sat there were the ones that are at the bottom of the container. Can you see those are just kind of hanging out right, right above the bottom red line there? They grew down, they're not dead, they are technically alive, but there's no roots growing down or out from them. All the action is at the top. So if you were to choose a container root system that looked like this or this, which would you pick? This one or this one? And, and why? So this one or this one? Now I could tell if I was looking at you, I could tell by body language that we we're ready to kind of explain this because everyone I think would understand, understand that because there are so many roots growing down here, very few going out, that it would not be a good root system to put into a soil that's going to develop this very shallow root system, which is a whole lot of soils and sites. This already has a handsome allocation of horizontal roots. And there are some roots that grow down, but most of them are going out to the side. I think it's pretty clear you can to, to see that. And so this is going to be better adapted to the urban landscape and getting established than the deeper roots in the container. All right, so that's root growth in nature. And that last two slides sort of sets us up for how how do we do this? How do we get a root system to do this? And, and that's what we're going to do next. And give you some understanding why so many root systems that you and I see don't look like that horizontal root system. You, you're going to understand it in about 10 minutes. So here we can look at the, many of the field nurseries in the southeast U.S. Uh, grow field grown plants from containers. And this particular one you can see the this is about a three inch caliper tree planted from a one gallon container. And you can see that one gallon container imprint on the root system. I call it an imprint because the roots circled at this one gallon size and never really grew out from it. And this is what a field looks like 5,000 trees on the ground after a 70 mile an hour tropical system looks like very, really healthy trees with very poor root structure. So health and structure are not related to one another. They're completely different entities 
lots of health. You can see the tree looks very, very healthy, a lot of vitality and uh, poor root system. So this we would consider looking at the 3,000 or more root systems in the, oh gosh, eight, more than 80 studies on this over the years, all on the website. You can read the whole articles. This is my representation of the ideal root system. And notice that there are straight roots, some at the surface, straight roots, some at the surface. So some originate right from the base of that trunk. So here's our root observations detail. Here's where the discussion in your industry starts. A piece of paper that looks like this. And you've got in this green industry committee meeting, that, or we'll call it what you will, nursery stock improvement committee, where you've got your landscape architects, your contractors, your growers, your arborists, urban foresters, et cetera, in the room, your eight or 10 representatives in the room. And you say, well, what don't we like first is it a good idea? Do we think we have good? Is there, just, is there room for improvement in nursery stock? You, you come to agreement there. And if there is, then how do we get there? And maybe you start here. Maybe you're not as aggressive as, as we are with, with all the words that are on here in illustrations, but you get to decide in your industry. So in any case, uh, you're welcome to use this, download it, edit it, throw it away, whatever you'd like to do, but it's the best thoughts of, of some of the the folks that have been around a little bit in uh, in this arena, both for containers and and B and, and B. Again, these are open source. You can use them. You can modify them. You don't have to attribute anybody to this. Uh, they're simply out there for you guys to use. And there's more. All right. So let's look at the origin of deep roots in in containers or field. And I, I wish I could get the answer to this question right now, but I'm going to ask it anyway and kind of assume that that you either plant some bare root plants, and you're probably like us, hardly any, but some of the container plants that that you purchase probably were bare rooted into those containers. I'm going to I'm going to guess. So at least some of some of you may not be per pervasive, but some of you. So those bare root plants come from a place that um, is very similar to the production methods I'm going to show you here. So I want you to look at the natural system, which we saw on the left a few slides ago. So there's the natural root system and contrast it with the one on the right. This is a field grown plant on the right. And see the difference in the top root orientation right away. There's straight roots, but none at the surface uh, on the right, you see. There's, there's straight roots, but they all angle down at 45 degrees or more. There's none at the surface here. Here's the soil line up here. And so there's this strange spot here, six, eight inches long of no roots coming out. Well, that's odd. How does that happen? I'm going to show you. So this tree's got two options to grow out into the landscape. They can do what I saw in the late 70s when I started digging trees up. With the original root system I got from the nursery when I planted these trees three years ago. So I planted these in 76, dug them up in 79, and I saw this whole new root system trying to form. These were not dead, but they were unhappy. They were just sitting there, obviously sitting in water. So the tree can either put out this new set of adventitious roots or Roots can grow from the cut ends and then grow up and reach the surface and then grow out. Sort of like what I saw again in the late 70s here where roots growing out from the cut ends and then up. You can kind of see that in the back here. Roots are growing up toward the surface of the soil. So in either case, they either growing from the tips and growing up or um, developing an adventitious root system the tree is stressed. And we've come to kind of call this transplant stress, although we caused it <laughs> because we planted a tree that looked very unlike the upper left, which is in nature. We planted a tree that looks like the upper right photo, right? So how many of you have seen this in the landscape? Roots just kind of emerging about three feet from the trunk. Well, now you know where they came from. Uh, if you take this root system up, you'll find this. So the original roots grow down, new roots come, 
from grow up and then grow out. So you've got this three foot space here, which is between here and here, where the root sort of looks like a U or a V, if you will. And I, that can't be great for the structure of the tree. I mean, a lot of trees, maybe most trees eventually come to, to become established, but how many trees are we losing in the meantime? We don't know, there's no numbers. Nobody has any idea. So this is nature. This is what we see so often arriving either in containers because they were in a field and bare rooted into the container or directly from a field nursery. Um, soil would be up here, no roots in that, in that area there. What about this as an option, the lower right? Might that make a pretty good start to grow into this? I think so. So you've got straight roots. Some are at the surface, not so bad. And 2013, we published uh, an article or two in Arboriculture and Forestry that shows you how to do that. You know, I think that's our goal is to get some deep roots and then some straight roots, some at the surface. So how does that happen? How does the deep root system get there? Two different ways to produce a tree. In the field, starting with seeds, and then those, those seeds are uh, develop a shoot and they're grafted. This develops a, or this taproot that develops from the seed grows down because the, the beds are just so loose and the, the taproot is very happy. It, the tree often doesn't branch for, for many species. And so many of these trees are cut. The, the, the taproot is cut. It's a sudden impact. When you sudden impact a root or a, a shoot, you're going to get sprouts typically right from the cut. Uh, this is Gary Watson's photograph work he did about 10 or 12 years ago. Here's the exact same root system one year later. You see all the roots there uh, at the bottom. No roots here along the four, six, eight inches of root shank. And I showed you that earlier, no roots for six or eight inches, I think I mentioned. And that's the reason is because the roots are undercut. Root systems are undercut. This has been the way it's been done for a hundred years or more in uh, North America. All the roots come from one spot. So when you see a tree come like this in, on the right, you see no roots coming from what was the taproot. That's actually part of the root system. And what we have, what we used to think was the trunk flare is actually this artificial place right here that was created by us, right? This, this, all these are adventitious roots here. This is the original tap root. And uh, what do we do with this plant? Yeah, that's a good question. So how does the deep root system develop in a container nursery? That's the point here. So now yeah, we're in pretty good shape. So here's some corcus seeds or, or uh, maple cuttings, Acer on the right. Going into a typical propagation container, there's a bazillion different types of propagation containers. We've worked with many of them over the past 15 years and published a lot on this in uh, scientific literature. Roots deflected down typically in a container. So the most common root deflection in these small propagation containers, and those containers are two to three inches in diameter typically, six inches, four inches deep in that neighborhood, maybe maybe a little bit deeper, depends. The most common deflection is the root hits the side and goes down. It's not around. So the most common deflection is down. When the tree's still a little bit older, one gallon, three gallon, then they start going around. But, and I don't know the reason for this, it's just what I've seen a lot over and over again. Now, what this does, where does it put the root tips? Look at the center example. Where's all the root tips? at the bottom of the container, right? You don't see any root tips to, to, to matter in the top or even the middle. So when you pot that up into a three gallon container and you see, wow, what's all those roots doing at the bottom? There's hardly anything on the side. You can actually see that because the liner, that's the upper left small plant, the liner in the propagation container had all its roots at the bottom. And so it grew everything out the bottom. And so this area, right here, if you could see my arrow, that would have been this part of the root system two years ago. So it's hardened, it's suberized, 
And so there, and, and there's no root tips there. All the root tips are at the bottom. So you get this very bottom heavy root system. So you end up with the thing on the right coming out of a three gallon container. There's a big party at the bottom of the pot because the roots were oriented down by the propagation container. So that all resulted from a, a very sudden impact of, of cutting a roots uh, that nature does slow impact uh, on, the, on the left. Very different root system. So how do we improve this? It's air pruning. And what air pruning is, is and this is a paper pot, and we've looked at various of these, the Ellie pot, the Jiffy pot, the Pioneer pot. There's a number of these out there. And I, I don't think there's a perfect pot, but I do think there's almost a perfect root system. And I think that's what we're looking at here. So don't pay much attention to the advertisements and the uh, about, about what container the plant is grown in. Look at the root system. Spec specify the root system and what it should look like. And we, we gave on the website our, our very detailed specifications and details on how to do that. So you can see that the root system, the taproot here is air pruned at the bottom. And what that means is it literally grows outside the pot at night into the air. Now it's dark at night, humidity goes up. Typically this is in a greenhouse. And so that root is very happy at night, but during the day tends to dry down a little bit. Humidity goes down in the greenhouse. That fruit, that root that's sticking out into the air, literally, uh, dies back. And so you start getting this wave, W-A-V-E, wave of new roots generating up along that taproot. And you can see that wave has just about reached the top of this root system. This is almost ready to pot up into the next size. And when you do, uh, on the right, you're seeing a detail of the left photograph. That's a mahogany tree. We grew from seeds in this paper pot, and you can see many, what's the theme? One of the themes for today, many straight roots, some at the surface, right? You can see many, many straight roots, some at the surface. Yeah, that's good stuff right there. So here is a little more detail. Here's some air pruning that's happening on the taproot. And so the tap roots stop growing. You see there's very little growth down here. Most of the roots are coming from these lateral roots all the way up to the surface. So, so far so good, but those roots were deflected down. You can see, if you, you gotta use your imagination a little bit, but you can kind of see this root is deflected down. That puts the root system, root tips oriented downward. Not great, right? So roots are at the surface, but since they were not allowed to go out, into the air at night in the greenhouse, they were deflected because the walls were solid on the sides of this container. So they, they, grew, they grew downward. And when you plant that liner, it's a liner on the left, when you plant that liner out into the field, you get this. And so what you're looking at is inclusions, vascular constrictions, because each of these roots here, these roots growing down got bigger as did the taproot, and you end up with a big clump of roots. And there's the imprint on that root on the right from the liner that you're seeing on the, on the left. I hope that makes sense. So when the roots grow out in this, this is a nursery, nursery tree, most of the roots are growing out the bottom because that's where all the root tips were. See, this makes sense, right? When you see it, and explain this way, but very few of us, now I didn't know this 20 years ago. I didn't know how that root system there got like that, but now I understand it. It starts back uh, in the nursery. So here's a model to share with your grower friends. So the seed germinates, it grows out the bottom at night, that stimulates lateral roots, and then that tree is now ready to pot up because lateral roots have reached the top. Then you shift to a bigger container. Because the lateral root tips are oriented laterally, they grow out into the three gallon laterally. And now you have the ideal root system. This is not difficult. It's really not difficult. The growers that have transitioned to this and over the past 10 years are not going back. 
to it. I can tell you that for sure. They're too the trees grow faster and they establish like that in the landscape because you've got all these laterals uh, growing out into the landscape instead of everything at the bottom where there's too much water or not enough air in so many landscapes. All right, so here's another way to get at it. So if you're working with a container, a little propagation container that's open at the bottom, but has plastic sides so the roots can't air prune and so they're all, all deflected down, then you can shave using a scissors or pruner and various ways to, to go about go about this. So when we shave this little liner, we get this perfect root system. This is finished three gallon or 15, one or the other, I forget which. I think it's a three gallon container. Straight roots and you can finish the rest of that phrase, right? That's what we're looking for. So just to wrap up here, here's a three gallon being shaved. So if you're a, a grower or potting up into a 15 or a 30, or if you're, a, uh, you're planting these smaller three gallon trees and, and you're doing the shaving, the root ball gets smaller. So compared to the unshaved, it gets the root system is smaller. You're taking away all the roots that are on the outside. So you're taking away all these roots on the outside when you're doing this, uh, when you plant. So here's this little study we did where we took these three gallons, we shaved or we didn't, and then we put them into 15 gallon containers, shaved or not. And here's those plants finishing in the 15. So here's the trunk, about an inch and a half trunk. Here's the three gallon container position. Here's the 15 gallon container position. So you'll notice there's a lot of roots on the outside edge of the 15, that's where I want them. I don't want a deflected root system here where you can see the three gallon here. See the imprint of this three is back in here and all the big wood has been deflected down and there's hardly anything growing out here into the 15. I know you've all seen that compared to when the three is shaved, you get so much more wood out to the edge. So you end up with straight roots, some at the surface, all the way out to the edge of the pot. Now you can, at the dashed white line, when you plant, you can shave that 15 going into the ground or going into a 100 gallon container, wherever this is going, into the next soil or, or pot. Stuff works, ladies and gentlemen. So what we talked about today is uh, four things. Uh, well, there are four actions I wanted you to consider. We, we talked a lot about two of them. Pruning and planting to improve branch architecture or branch structure. Uh, various people use those two different terms. And the importance of that, I give you three different reasons for that. And then second was remove roots growing over the collar. We didn't really talk much about that, but we did in the last 10 minutes or so, talk quite a bit about removing those at the edge of the root ball when you're planting into the landscape. Now, if the grower did not do that along the way, and there are growers in Florida and California that, and in Texas that I know are doing some or a lot of this or all of their plants in, in, in large container. In one case, 1,000 acre nursery is, is, this is their standard procedure in, in Florida, very successful large nursery. Uh, every pot up uh, to the next container, the, uh, the root balls are shaved. And then I, I, I could give you many examples of folks that plant thousands of trees in landscapes that do the same thing when the plant goes into the soil of the landscape. So. This is catching on. I have no idea how common it is. I can't tell. There's no surveys done. And, and um, but it's stabilizes the tree very quickly. That that shaving does a does quite a bit to because there are so many roots that grow out close to the surface of the soil. That root ball is stabilized very very soon after it's it's planted. I didn't show you any evidence of that today, but there's plenty in the literature that we've generated and. Um, I can hang my hat. If I had a hat on, I would hang it on that fact. So with that, I'm going to leave it. We're about at, at time. And uh, 
we'll catch catch you next time. Love to come out and work with you guys in the field when we can <laughs> someday. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Ann. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilman. What a great talk. Um, you can't get away that easily. We do have some questions for you to answer. So sure. would appreciate it if you would spend a few minutes with us um, answering some of these questions. So uh, let me just go ahead and shoot. If you guys have questions, please enter them in the Q&A section of the Whova app, not the chat session. OK, um, Dr. Gilman, in your experience, what is the best way to ensure trees are installed that have been grown with the best practices you refer to. I assume that specifications are a big step. Secondly, who inspects for this and are they qualified? There's no qualification for this that the ISA has. There, but there's, there's no qualification really for any practice in arboriculture other than track that I'm aware of. So, this has to be understood in the industry locally. And the culture of that understanding has to develop over time. It, it's not going to, it's not going to change overnight. And that's why I suggest for New Mexico and, and any parts of the countries that don't have what we have, which is the Florida grades and standards for nursery stock, develop something like that and our details and specs on the website that I've mentioned several times are a good start to that. And I, I think it really under, it, it starts not by talking about it because I talked about it, but really didn't make any changes in the industry until I did it and understood it. And man, could I communicate it then. So there is somewhat of a leap of faith that that folks have to take between their current understanding and, and, and the understanding I have of what makes trees strong after planting and, and stable. But uh, I, I would say, trust the reviewers that reviewed the stuff that we put out there in the journal, you know, my colleagues, and uh, we've showed pretty clearly that straight root sum at the surface is a great place to start. And if you get to the point where that makes a lot of sense to you, because if you've seen it, you rock the tree back and forth a year after planting and you go, oh, wow, this thing's really pretty stable. I mean, you don't have to run a research study to do this. Just plant 10 trees and shave them at planting. Plant 10 trees and don't shave them at planting. Come back in a year. See which ones are most stable. The ones that you shave to planting are because you cut the roots that come out from the side of the pot at the point where they go down. That's what shaving does. New roots are going to come out right there at that point. And they're going to be very, very stable. So I would say teach yourself that it works and then you're going to be a better instructor and, and be more passionate about what you believe. I mean, that's how life works, right? <laughs> sure. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Gilman. OK, um, next question. As we all have been aware of the climate changes in all areas of New Mexico and across the country, really, do nurseries have to make adjustments to what they keep in stock? And are these changes put out to the public and municipalities? The only way that growers are going to change any practice, whether it's growing good root systems, growing dominantly to trunks, keeping aspect ratios under a certain size or certain species they grow. There's only one way and that's the market. So, uh, until buyers get their act together and agree what quality is or agree on a list of plants, growers aren't going to respond. So if, if there are, I think, yeah, well, I, I won't, I won't go where, you know, it's just so cold in the last few days, but um, I won't go there. But if, if, until we get to the point where we've really changed that culture, um, it's, it's not, it's not going to happen. So we, we've got to get to that sort of agreed upon understanding of what, um, of what good quality is and, and what species. I mean, there's New York City, you know, that, that's a big place, uh, Manhattan. When, when they went out to purchase trees, they got so frustrated, they started buying in bulk and pre-ordering. So they would put a certain percentage down 
they were planting 20,000 trees a year at one point, uh, maybe still are. And so they would go and, and make arrangements with growers for certain species. And so you can look along their streets and they, they have a good uh, diversity of different species. So it all comes from the pocketbook. It all comes from the dollar. Uh, and, and that's where it has to start. That's what changes practice. For sure, thank you. Okay, next question. Um, how important is pruning cycle and frequency in determining the amount to prune? Well, it, it's almost everything, except for the amount of alteration you wanna make in, in the future growth in the plant on the parts you prune. So you judge how much to prune on your competition based on the tolerance of the customer the for voids when your pruning cycle is and the species and then the vitality of the tree has to come in there too so there's at least four factors there and there's probably some others we could list that you that go through your mind to determine whether you're going to make a inch and a half cut on that cut on a stem or a three inch cut or three two inches two inch cuts so all that plays you can't read a book, you can't go to a seminar, you can't even go to a one day workshop on pruning and watch and participate in pruning and understand it. It, it takes, well, in my case, it, it's really taken about six or eight years when I started in the late eighties doing this. It took me that long to really understand dose, customer aside, pruning cycle aside, um, you know, how much can I get away with pruning? And what I've learned over the years, is usually I've taken out far little, far, far too little uh, if I'm on a long pruning cycle. So if I want to affect change for five or 10 years, you've got to be very aggressive. If you can come back every year or two, you know, several half inch to one inch cuts might be enough on, a, uh, on certain trees. If you can come back every, every year, so yeah, it's definitely in the formula, but it's 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 not everything, but don't forget about it. It sounds like you're not. It sounds like you're, you know, I mean, that is a, it's a, one of the keys to, to doing this the right way and being asked to, to do it again next year by the customer. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, let's see. I, I'm trying to understand this question, but is your picture of an ideal nursery grown root system have too many roots. Too many roots. Yeah. Wouldn't wow. you, that, wouldn't that, you see more root competition amongst roots as they grow out? Yeah. I mean, uh, that's a good question. And uh, I don't really know the answer to it. I, I suspect, you know, we've followed root systems because I did this later part of my career, right? The last 10 years, I've not followed these trees out. Uh, and I think some of that, you know, for many years, three to five years is about it. And I, I suspect that some of that is the species, the, the mahogany, in that case, mahogany, acer, corcus, they pretty much, uh, those are the three that we worked a lot uh, with. I would be much less concerned about having too many roots than having too few and they're all deformed. How's that? <laughs> I like, I'll let the lots of small roots duke it out. I mean, what makes, what makes you really think is when you shave or don't, you know, you shave during production and then you shave at planting and then you come back in a year after you plant and you try to move the tree and you go, oh my gosh, why didn't I do this 10 years ago? As the other one's just rocking back and forth and it's all that you did nothing at planting. So You'll experience the same thing. Just do it. It's like pruning. Just do it. And watch what happens and share it with uh, people you know. Okay, great. That was a good diplomatic answer. <laughs> um, how much research has gone into the current use of reclaimed water and the effect on tree growth and root growth? Is there a standard of water quality for reclaimed water? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. 
Yeah, uh, Nell DeMathini, uh, Hort Science, Nell Bartlett would be the best person to ask, answer, ask that question to. Nell DeMathini in California. Yeah, she works with Reclaim Water a lot. Okay, great. Um, what do you think is the best way to communicate this information to customers of a retail nursery who are usually planting um, themselves? I think you start with convincing yourself. That's where you have to start. So the, the best teachers of anything are those that really understand the topic themselves. I mean, I, I think we would all agree on that. You'll be less convincing if you've only read my book or someone else's book or went to some seminars. Uh, you've got to get out there and, and do it. So that that's where, and then it takes a good three, four years to really understand the basics of how much to take off and what happens when you only take 25% of that branch off? It really doesn't slow down the growth that much compared to 50 or 75%. So you get some calibration for how much you should take off. More is usually better, um, but you leave a bigger hole. So, you know, you, we talked about that. I think you show them and you explain as much as you can what we just went through and all of what we just went through is on my website with all these videos. We've got a hundred videos. I may have mentioned that earlier and uh, lots of PowerPoints. Uh, we have produced and others have cue cards, printing cue cards, which are little things that go in your top pocket. They're about uh, three and a half inches wide, about seven inches tall. You can print those from our website. The, the, you go go through the basics of structural pruning using some of the same illustrations that that I shared with you this morning. Yeah, and uh, yeah, just go teach teach kids, scouts. I mean, there's just people have no clue that trees should be pruned for structure, right? I mean, you know that commercial arborists know that, municipal arborists know when they teach uh, master gardeners and citizens and all this. There's no understanding it's not taught in our school system mostly so we got to do it right absolutely thank you dr gilman one last question here um can you digress a little on how not pruning at planting precipitates the tendency for people to, for people to lion's tail yeah so when that's a great question and it's uh i'll get into a little bit more detail so what happens is because arborists typically don't prune trees, if the younger trees, it's landscapers, it's folks that are probably not in most of our arboriculture audiences. So they're removing using branch removal cuts, not reduction cuts. They're removing the low secondary branches and keeping all those original upright branches that were part of the nursery crown. They were in on the tree when the tree was planted in, in the nursery and in your landscape. Those are kept on the tree without reducing them. So with all the secondary branches take uh, removed and all the uprights left intact, they grow like crazy upright. So you get this six to 10 foot tall trunk that folks from the ground have cleared up. So you can now see under the tree, see the, maybe see some of the mall sign, you see the gas station sign a little bit, but now sprouts come back because of all these removal cuts. And then someone comes back and raises it up again. Maybe an arborist get involved in this at this point. At that point, you've got a 15 inch trunk and three seven inch branches originating from six to 10 feet off the ground. No one's gonna take those off. So you're gonna, you're gonna be either asked to, or you're gonna decide to lion's tail the tree because it's the only option to meet the customer's object, uh, objective, which is sign viewage or store viewage or whatever the view is, traffic lights, stop signs. And that's where it starts. So if we can if we can keep those branches small at planting by pruning them, especially the ones that the all of them, <laughs> to keep pr prune the, the largest aspect ratio ones at planting, they're going to stay small and they're going to be more likely to be removed. And that at least pushes the 
main branches to the top of the tree at planting. Yeah, so if we don't prune those in the top four or five feet at planting, that's going to be the start of our permanent crown, of which we're going to lion's tail from there. Whoops, from there on up. All right, perfect. Well, Dr. Gilman, again, another enlightening discussion. We really appreciate your time um, coming back to Think Trees. Hopefully next time it will be in person. <laughs> we'll be able to. All right, let's do it outside. I want to 